If everyone stays healthy is a caveat often applied in baseball. For the Pittsburgh Pirates, that caveat has become a nightmare. Three outfielders, two catchers, two shortstops, two relievers, two starters, and a second baseman. No, that is not the beginning of an epic joke or a little-known verse of the 12 Days of Christmas. It's the last month of Pirates baseball. What's up, everybody? I'm Tara Wellman. Welcome back to Bird Seeds. If you're new here to this channel, thanks so much for checking it out. I cover the St. Louis Cardinals for birdsontheblack.com, and I create daily and weekly videos right here on YouTube. My goal is always to keep you, the fans, in the loop and entertained. This episode is a series preview as the St. Louis Cardinals get set to welcome the Pittsburgh Pirates for four games at Busch Stadium. If you like what you see in here, do your girl a favor, hit that like button, and if you want more, you can always subscribe to get all the latest updates. Now, the Cardinals have had a rough week, dropping back-to-back -back series in very frustrating fashion. But speaking of frustrating, the Pirates came oh so close to a two-game mini-sweep of the Texas Rangers to start the week, and then the bullpen blew the save and the win on Wednesday. My guest today was there to cover it all. Please welcome back to the show, Alex Stumpf. Alex, thanks so much for joining me fresh off of, well, a frustrating Pirates game, but nonetheless still at the ballpark. How's it going, Alex? <laughs> Pretty good. That was a, a frustrating way to end it. Back end of the bullpen's been really taxed lately. Had to go to non-premium relievers. But that just means that Vasquez and Crick are going to be fresh for this series against the Cardinals. So, you should have been Pirates. For, you should have been rooting for the Rangers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Just, a lot, though, has happened since the Cardinals and the Pirates last saw each other very early in the season. Primarily, like I think everyone who plays for the Pirates has been hurt since then. <laughs> who is even on this team right now that Cardinals fans will recognize when they get to St. Louis? I mean, that's how I feel like this needs to start. Well, Josh Bell. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's he's tearing up the ball. He this is the best we've ever seen him hit hit it. Not only just the season as a whole, but this kick that he's on right now. I think he's had like nine extra base hits over the last eight games, all during a hitting streak. It's he's ridiculous right now. This is the best Josh Bell has ever hit. I'm sure he's you know, salivating to face some Cardinal pitching right about. So seems like he always hits the cards pretty well. It, it uh, certainly does. <laughs> They just got Melky Cabrera. No, they've always had Melky Cabrera. I mean, I guess since the year started. But they just got Starling Martin, Gregory Polanco back. That's good. Uh, the infield, Cole Tucker's up instead of Eric Gonzalez, who was the shortstop the first time these teams faced each other. Basically, the injuries have been mostly to the rotation. The big ones right now are Jamison Tyon and Chris Archer. There's an unbelievable slim chance that the Cards will see Chris Archer on Sunday. Very likely not. I mean, parts are fortunate in the sense that, you know, they still got Musgrove, Lyles, and Williams going in this series, who were three guys who were starters at the beginning of the year. And this is a very big uh, first series and a big road trip for them. Uh, so they're lucky in that regard. Those are the two big injuries right now. Archer was the big deadline acquisition last year and pitched well before that last start against the Dodgers, where he went immediately on the IL the next day. Something obviously wasn't right. And Tyon is supposed to be the ace. He hadn't pitched, you know, 100% this year, but that's what you expect him to be. And then he's like, yeah, I haven't felt all, all year, and kind of makes sense now. He's got to be shut down for a month before they figure out what to do next. So <laughs> I did some digging on the MLB archives, and there had never been a year since 2001, which is as far back as it goes, where the Pirates had to put – Eight, more than 18 different players on the disabled list or injury list and already up to 17 so that's not good that's not how you draw the season up for sure especially when you look at a division no, no. that's going to be yeah i mean it's you know especially when you look at a division that's going to be as tough as this one is you you always kind of enter with that caveat of well look here's how we can compete assuming everyone's healthy and that's 
been far from the case. You did mention Josh Bell, though. I want to talk about him. I asked for some Twitter questions. One of them was about Josh Bell and Melky Cabrera and how they're kind of driving this offense. But when I did the first series preview ahead of the Pirates and the Cardinals playing earlier this year, talking to Nubias Wilborn, he basically was telling me that, that a lot of people were so down on Josh Bell that Josh kind of took that as a challenge to say, okay, look... <laughs> I'm not that guy, and I'm going to prove it. And right now it looks like that's exactly what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, Josh, in his rookie year, he had the good traditional numbers. He hit 26 homers, drove in 90-something runs, had a good batting average. It was a good offensive season. But last year, power numbers went way down. But I think a lot of people misconstrued that for a bad offensive season because his OBP went way up as a result. So it turned out to be pretty similar years. This year, we're seeing the good OBP. We're seeing the good power numbers. He's driving in runs. It's what you want from your cleanup hitter. This is He's getting the ball in the air for the first time like consistently. He, that had been a problem throughout his entire career. And I think that's where a lot of frustrations with Josh Bell came around. It's like, this guy's 6'5", something pounds, built like an NFL tight end. Why is he hitting it on the ground so often? Now he's putting it in the air, and he hit a 472-foot home run today. It, it was pretty Insane. fun. <laughs> the the fun replay, it was just like, what? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's got to be a, a huge boost for, for this team, but also the hitting streak that, that Cabrera's on right now. You mentioned it. I mean, yep. he's been there, but what he's doing right now is more what you expect from him, right? That's what he's there to do for this team. Yeah, I mean, coming into the year, Lonnie Chisholm Hall was supposed to be the guy who got in any time while Gregory Polanco recovered from his shoulder injury. Uh, Chisholm Hall breaks his hand at the very end of spring, so Melky got his chance, and he's made the most of it. I mean, he's been a fun veteran presence in a young clubhouse. I mean, he's having a lot of fun being in Pittsburgh. He's getting time to play, and he's hitting well. Yeah, I mean, he's probably not hitting as well as the batting average and all the other stats would say that he actually is kind of relying on the batted ball and play gods at the moment. But he's he's hitting well. He's hitting with authority. And the joke that's going around Twitter is, you know, he's a professional hitter. It's like, of course, they're all professional hitters. But it's fun just to see a couple people get really angry about that. Yeah, that's one of – I love those, those old baseball cliches that you're like, well – Obviously. <laughs> Why did yeah. this become a thing? But it is. And, you know, it's so Tyler true, Lyons though. Tyler Lyons had to bet today. He was, by the loosest of definitions, a professional hitter. <laughs> well, we're going to have to talk about Tyler Lyons at some point because my uh, podcasting co host for uh, one of my uh, Cardinals podcasts is a huge Tyler Lyons fan and very much looking forward to the return of Tyler Lyons. So we'll talk about him in a minute, but. We'll get to pitching uh, a little bit further on. But it, it is it is interesting when you see a guy like Cabrera who does have that veteran presence. It's often really hard to quantify what that does for a clubhouse or what that does for a lineup, what it does for you know the way that he takes at bats, right? Because there are professional hitters who are really bad at the end of their careers. <laughs> but when you bring something like that that maybe you can't turn into some sort of numerical value or, or some sort of you know analytic... It's got to be helpful just because of the experience, if nothing else. Yeah. And, I mean, it's an old sports writer cliche. I mean, I don't discredit it. I mean, I just gave that experience and, you know, leadership as a selling point of Melky Cabrera. But then there are other people that are like, you know, he could – we had a sports – we are talking head in Pittsburgh sports say that uh, Melky is going to be a mentor for Starling Marte. It's like, Marte's 30 years old. He doesn't need any more mentoring. This is Starling. Come on. So it gets kind of t carried away at some points like that, but it, it's nice to have a quality veteran hitter like that. It, the Pirates are known whenever they do hit the lottery in uh, free agency. It's usually pitchers, whether it's A.J. Burnett, Francisco Liriano the first time around. Now it looks like Jordan Lyles. He's been something special so far back in the starting role, but they've had – more than their fair share of success also with outfielders. They haven't really needed it because, you know, there have always been two or three really good outfielders in Pittsburgh. But, you know, when it, whether it was a Matt Joyce or uh, now it's Melky, they've revived a couple careers also. He was out of baseball for a lot of time last year. He wasn't getting this chance in April and May. I mean, he played well with Cleveland down the stretch, but they were kind of 
desperate at the time. This is a different situation for him, and he's making the most of it. And that's all you can really ask for someone mm-hmm. like that who comes into an organization and has a chance to make an impact in a variety of different ways. You mentioned getting Polanco back. That's a, a big it's a big name for this for this club. A guy that has has had a lot of expectations on him, I think, since you mentioned all those outfielders that you kind of come up and and expect great things of. He hasn't maybe quite hit that peak that a lot of people expected then of course starting the year injured. Is he in a position now where he can kind of build back up to what those expectations of, of Polanco are? Yeah, I think we saw about three months of those expectations last year. He started slow. They made a tweak to his batting stance, moved him off the plate a bit. And then for those from like early June to before the injury in early September, he was one of the best hitting outfielders in baseball. And he was providing relatively good defense and base running on top of it. He looked like the guy who was pretty much promised. And now this year, fielding's been bad, but, you know, he hasn't had a whole lot of reps because of it. And even if the shoulder is not as strong as it used to be, he could still be semi confident in the field, hopefully. He's getting the ball in the air right now, which is, I feel like I say that all the time every time I (laughs) talk to you. But he's doing a good job, you know, he's driving the ball finally. It looks like, at least offensively, he's almost back to where he was uh, before the injury. Which, if the Pirates can get that bat back, that's important. That's a really important bat in this lineup. I do feel like we have some sort of conversation about launch angle <laughs> anytime yeah. that we that we talk. But it's you know it's all a part of trying to find ways for these guys to be successful, right? And and whatever the terminology is, you need to get the ball in the air to to have some level of success. So for Polanco, that is, I would imagine, a great sign. I know. When Cardinals fans watched Marcelo Zuna coming off of a shoulder injury, well, really still having a shoulder injury last year, they watched him fail to get the ball in the air. I mean, his his launch angle was as, as pathetic as it can possibly be. A lot of ground balls, a lot of balls just really driven straight into the ground, and, and that has a huge effect on the way you're able to produce at the plate, as well as you know what you do in the field. So that's a, a familiar concept for Cardinals fans. Another question I got asked about Jung Ho Gung, and this is a weird situation, I think, because there's it's so layered, but when you just look at the baseball part of what he's brought back to this team, there's not a lot there right now. <laughs> no, no, and it is giving him a humongous gift to just talk about the baseball part of what he brings to the Pirates right now. But strictly in between the lines, he's batting like 150 at the time, a little bit of power, but if it's not leaving the park, it's not a hit right now. And he's swinging in a ton, a lot of strikeouts. He's quite frankly looking like someone who hadn't played in the major leagues for two years which isn't exactly what you want from, you know, your starting third baseman. Colin Moran's been streaky. He hit a homer today, but before then he had been on a really long lull. Uh, Brian Hayes is the top position player prospect in the farm system. And even though the glove is major league ready, the bat needs a little more time to stew. I think that's what it always was, you know, that best case scenario, Gung would be able to give a good year in the majors. And then you go to Brian early next year. <sighs> But he hasn't done it so far, and you got to wonder, maybe they rush Cabrian the same way that they rush Tucker out of need, out of necessity. Is there any feeling of, I don't know, regret might be too strong a word, but of feeling like, ah, oh, maybe this wasn't the right commitment to make? Yes, I think there's definitely some sentiment around that. Again, looking past all the off-the-field stuff that would make him not exactly a desirable person to have on your team. But right now, there were other infielders who were available that were at a similar price point. We just saw Drupal Cabrera with the Rangers. He would have been a nice fit in Pittsburgh. Uh, it wasn't this was the only third baseman the Pirates could have afforded. This was the one that they spent years trying to get in, and they thought he would be the best bang for the buck, and that he would be the guy he would go back to his 2015 2016 self where he was one of the more underrated hitters in baseball he hasn't been that and after about 100 plate appearances you have to wonder will he ever be that again yeah, yeah. and that was 
I mean, that was always the question, trying to get him back into this position. And, and right now it's looking like a pretty resounding no, but it is just five and a half weeks or so into the season. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Let's talk about some of that pitching that we kind of ventured into. And then I pulled it back towards the, the offense for a moment. Um, one of the questions on Twitter was directly related to pitching, primarily because the Cardinals have more than once in the last week been completely shut down by a guy who kind of resurrected a minor league career and tops out at like 87 miles an hour and the Cardinals can't pick it up. So the question on Twitter was, which <laughs> which minor league career uh, guy are the, are the Pirates going to call up for this series? In jest, of course, but the reality is that the Pirates have some strong, solid pitching, so strong starting pitching going in this series. Yeah, and uh, Lyons, I guess, isn't quite a minor league. You know, he was floating around as a fifth starter bullpen arm over the last couple of years, and he's pitched really well at Pittsburgh so far. So I guess that would kind of qualify as an answer to the question there. Uh, fastball's high, curveball's low. He's looked good so far. Uh, Musgrove was the big piece back in the Garrett Cole trade, and quite frankly, he's, at least in my opinion, has been out pitching Garrett Cole so far this year. He's throwing more sliders instead of cutters. He's cut down on his fastball usage. It, it, he looks good right now. More breaking stuff than usual. He looks deadly. He's going to go game one that series. I think that's the game everyone in Pittsburgh is the most confident about, you know, the Pirates winning, regardless of whoever, whomever the Cardinals start that game. And then there's Trevor. I mean, Trevor is, I, I see these tweets floating around that the Marlins, under Lorio those last couple years, they traded Di Sclafani and they traded Castell and they traded uh, uh, Paddock and all these good pitchers. And Trevor doesn't even get the love on those <laughs> lists. Like, you want to talk about someone who's just punched in nine to five every day over the last two and a half years. He has been one of the more unheralded quality starting baseball. And I, I, I know Cardinals fans know this because they saw him all the time last year. That's kind of preaching to the choir. But hes I think he's one of the more underrated starters in the game. He doesn't have a great fit. He doesn't strike out a lot of batters, which makes him unappealing to, you know, fantasy nerds like me who, for most parts. So if you watch the guy pitch, he hits his spots. He gets weak contact. It's what you want from a starting pitcher. Yeah, that's an interesting matchup for me, I think, to see that, of course, Waka will go in the first game. Wainwright will oppose Trevor Williams in game two. And he's been a bit of a roller coaster so far this year. Wainwright has. So that's going to be an interesting matchup. Then if you look at the the next two games in the series, Jordan Lyles versus Miles Michaelis, that one's going to be really interesting because Michaelis coming off of a really strong start. But an another guy that has had some interesting struggles this year, given up a lot more home runs than he did last season, um, maybe is starting to correct course. And then Jordan Lyles, as you mentioned, a guy that the Pirates have been looking at as someone to really take one of those top spots in their rotation. Yeah, and we need someone like that, especially with Chris Archer and Jamison Tyon down at the moment. Everyone's got to step up. I mean, the bullpen was really taxed this two-game series in, against Texas, and it cost them game two because they couldn't go to, you know, to Cal Crick. They couldn't go to Pepe Vazquez down the stretch whenever they needed to. If the bullpen had been full, the, the Pirates would have won this game in a cakewalk. They need length out of these starters, especially Musgrove in that game. He's got to go at least six. And you would like to see Trevor and Lyles also go, you know, six, seven. That's been the one knock on Lyles so far. He hasn't had, he hasn't gone deep into games yet. He kind of had an injury prone spring training and, you know, converting back from relief pitcher to starter. He hasn't gone as deep. He could still throw the hundred pitchers so that, you know, you're supposed to as a starting pitcher, but he's not exactly as efficient as some of the other starters in the rotation. So he doesn't go as deep. Pirates need outs. From them. They need length this series, results and length. If they're gonna, if the Pirates are gonna do something this series, and by extension this road trip, it's gonna have to come from those three starting pitchers. That is a concept Cardinals fans are very familiar with right now because they've had very few starters go into the seventh inning, much less complete the seventh inning this season. A lot of five inning starts. Six inning starts are, are good for the Cardinals starting rotation right now. So they also need to get that length. That last game of the series could be interesting in that regard because it's the last game of the series, because it's Dakota Hudson, who has been probably the least efficient Cardinal starter against 
presumably Stephen Brault, who at this point, that's still TBD as far as an official announcement of the starting pitcher for the Pirates. But man, at the end of this series, to have those two guys as the, the series finale, it could get real weird on Sunday. And it's a shame. I mean, you kind of would like, or at least I would kind of like both teams to have an off day Monday so they can just <laughs> like, just really go for it. Yeah, yeah, that's probably not what we're going to see because the Pirates in the midst of this road trip, the Cardinals in the midst of, I think they have, they're in the middle of a stretch where they play 17 games in a row without an off day. So yeah, the the bullpen is going to be taxed. Everyone's going to be pressing a little bit. That last game could be interesting. If you were to look at this series between the Pirates and the Cardinals right now, is there a key for the Pirates right now as they start this long road trip? I, I mean, looking past what I already preached with the starting pitching length, I mean, that's first and foremost. you got to save the bullpen what you have right now, especially since Kell's on the I.L. Rodriguez hasn't pitched as well. Right now, the bullpen only has about two, two or three really reliable at the moment, and they're taxed. So it'd be nice for the offense to put up, you know, six or seven runs, you know, and the starter goes two innings, and boom, you win 7-1. It'd be nice to get a start like that every once in a while, but that's not how these Pirates work anymore. Every game has to be close or a complete blowout. Nothing in between. I, I think that's, I guess that's the second part. Like, just string a couple runs together. That's some high-quality analysis right there. Get good pitching score runs. <laughs> but, but just one big game. If they could get one big game this series where it, maybe not a complete blowout, but where you could – Russ, Crick, and Vasquez really get them right. That would be nice for the Pirates, for the whole road trip as a whole. There are some interesting things happening in the Cardinals bullpen right now. Dominic Leone is a guy who's been really struggling. Luke Gregerson just came back after basically not pitching at all last year and then not pitching most of the spring. He hasn't looked great. But I did want to mention this just because someone asked on Twitter. This is more a question for me, I think, but about the Cardinals starting rotation. There's some talk that there needs to be some changes as far as who those five guys are. And the reality for me is that, yes, I've said since the offseason that they needed an additional reliable starter outside of Miles Michaelis because Jack Flaherty has all the potential in the world, but he's not super reliable yet. He's still figuring out how to adapt to major league lineups. Michael Waka is always a bit of a wild card for me just because of the health issues. Adam Wainwright is just getting older and a bit of a wild card as a result. He's a number five right now, and that's fine, but that's all he is. And Dakota Hudson earned the spot out of spring training, but hasn't really looked like that guy since then. So should they have a guy they could go to that was a more reliable starter? Yes, I would love to see that. But will they make that change? I don't know, because the guys that everyone's suggesting are minor league guys. Ryan Helsley, Austin Gomber, uh, you know, some of these other guys that we've seen at the minor league level have success. Daniel Ponce de Leon came up, made a spot start. That's great. They're not necessarily any more reliable than the guys who are already in the starting rotation. They have some of the same tendencies. They may be more successful in the moment, but that doesn't mean they're going to be more reliable long term as you would get from, uh, you know, a veteran presence in the rotation. So, Long way to answer this question. I don't really envision them making a change abruptly to the starting rotation because I'm not sure that there's anyone that they could call up that would be more consistent, more reliable than the potential that they have already in the rotation. But keep an eye on this team as we, you know, creep toward the trade deadline because if they're still kind of trying to find their way with the starting rotation, they're one starter away from really being able to lock up a couple of series. So that's my long-winded answer to a question that has very little to do with the Pirates, but I wanted to get to that because it was a question brought up on Twitter. Alex, starting pitching is so important and it always has been. There's kind of been this transition to focusing more on the bullpen, but as you mentioned with the Pirates, getting those outings from the starters that give you the options of your bullpen, it's still so important. Yeah. And, I mean, <laughs> I think we saw that a lot in Pittsburgh this series whenever you had to start Brault and Kingham in back-to-back -back games. Both of them had been long relievers, so they're not fully stretched out, so they could only go four innings each. And then you really tax the bullpen, and you kind of 
you long for those days because neither one was pitching poorly. I think both only gave up two runs each. So it's like, yeah, under normal circumstances, they definitely would have at least gone out for a fifth inning, if not a sixth. That's why there is still the guy, whether it's the opener in Tampa Bay or the other 29 teams still using starters, someone has to get the, the bulk of the outs. And if someone, if that guy really doesn't do his job, it really hurts everyone. If for an extended period of time, it could take days. Even if you have an off day, the next day, I mean, that doesn't mean everyone's 100% whenever you get back. It really does tax the whole pitching staff if you don't get that length. And I think we're seeing that even with teams like the Brewers that kind of intentionally built the bullpen to be the strength of their pitching staff. Last year, they still got enough from their starters to hand it over to the bullpen. This year, they're not getting enough from their starters. So you still have to have that balance of how you're going to get those outs, how you sort of allocate the majority of those outs over the course of a game. And, you know, it's, it's an inexact science, if nothing else. Speaking of the Brewers, though, the last question I wanted to ask you is, as you're looking at the NL Central, I mean, this division, we all saw it coming on paper. It's This is one of the toughest divisions in baseball. There are so many teams that have the potential to either contend or to play spoiler to the teams that are at the top of the division. I, I don't think that's going to change for a long stretch of this season, but what's been your takeaway of the NL Central so far? I I think we're the best division in baseball. I think that's safe to say. I mean, Pirates are, what, fourth place with a winning record, and the Reds in last, and they have a plus 20 run differential or something <laughs> like that. It's like, okay, so this is just the Hunger Games. That's cool. Uh, I still think the Cardinals, if they're not the favorite to win the division, it, you know, they're one of. I'm, I'm still in general. I think the pitching staff is smoke and mirrors, especially the starters. I mean, a couple really – great hitters, but I don't think that makes a whole team. And the Brewers, I I kind of thought Milwaukee was walking on eggshells throughout most of last year, winning a lot of one-run games. And because, you know, they had Canable, they had Jeffers at his absolute best. Josh Hader was at his absolute best. Now they don't have Canable. Jeffers was also injured for a bit. Hater's been bit by the home run ball for a bit. If those, if they don't have that back end, I don't think they're going to be as competitive right now. Honestly, the way I see the division right now, it's Cubs and Cardinals still at the top, and the Pirates and Brewers a step behind that could make noise, maybe win a wild card if a couple things break their way. Yeah, yeah, it's, but I feel like every... And then since he's along for the ride. (laughs) But you know what, I've said, I've said this a couple times, while I don't think the Reds are, are positioned to be particularly competitive as far as fighting for a wild card spot or anything like that, I do think that they can impact who does get those postseason spots in this division because they can pick up key wins in the division or, as I was talking in a a Red Series preview earlier this season, if they become sellers at at the trade deadline and just sell everybody off, then all of a sudden you start looking at the schedule, who has the most games left against the Reds, well, you're going to pick up some some easier wins. So they could factor into what happens in this division, even if it's not by being one of those top four competitive teams in the division. So I'm, it's it's a, a fascinating mix of teams, some pretty evenly matched talent, I think. And it's going to make for some stressful uh, season series, I think, because you can't predict it. You can't go into a series thinking, all right, this is the game they're going to win. This is the game that's going to be... T-, because anything could happen between any one of the, these teams at any time, much like it will in this four-game set with the Pirates and the Cardinals. Alex, thanks so much for your time today. I will let you uh, move on with the rest of your day and get ready for this series. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a fun series. Okay, small sample size alert, but if you're looking for signs that the Cardinals' offense maybe could break out in this series, look at the starts from Trevor Williams and Jordan Lyles. Against Trevor Williams, Matt Carpenter, Paul DeYoung, Jose Martinez, Yadier Molina, Marcel Ozuna all have very good numbers. And against Jordan Lyles, well, don't look now, but Paul Goldschmidt has a 533 career average against the Pirates' starter. So, of course, those are limited numbers, but what the that does tell us is that these are guys the Cardinals in the past have seen and been successful against. So possibility for an offensive breakout there. But the key for the Cardinals right now, 
is yes, scoring runs, but also not putting themselves in a hole to begin with. This turn through the Cardinals starting rotation is going to be huge, especially when you look at how tight the race is in the NL Central, something that we're gonna be saying all summer, I'm sure. Thanks again to Alex Stump for joining me. Make sure that you are following him on Twitter. And if you have any Pirates questions, go ahead and shoot those at him. Make sure that you're subscribed to this channel or to the podcast if you're listening later on the Birds on the Black podcast feed. Check out birdsontheblack.com. Follow me on Twitter. I think that's all the self-promotion that I have to offer you. So for now, I'm Tara Wellman. I'll see you next time.